All right, so meet Micha. Uh, I'm excited to dive in today. Uh, can you pronounce your last name again, just for listeners? I don't want to mispronounce it. I can. So, hi, Mike. So, my name is Misha. So, that's with my first name and last name, Benoliel. 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 It's a great name. I really enjoy it. And you're, you're, you're from France, uh, living in Germany at the moment. Your team, presumably, is remote, distributed, uh, but in Europe. Um, you're the founder of Noodle. Do you want to give me a little context as to how you started the company and what the mission of the company is? Absolutely. Uh, just a bit on my background. So I, I live in San Francisco, mm. but I'm currently in Berlin to work with many of my engineers who are based in Europe. Uh, and we are working on a project which is called Noodle. And uh, Noodle is a decentralized uh, wireless network for connecting things to the internet. Um, and um, and we have a pretty innovative way of connecting these things because all you need to do is uh, download our app um, on your smartphone and then your smartphone turns into um, what we call an IoT hotspot, if you want, or a node. And then uh, when you are in proximity with other IoT devices uh, or Bluetooth tags like the Apple AirTag, for example, or any other device that uses Bluetooth low energy, which is exactly the same wireless protocol you use for your headphones uh, or speakers when you connect your phone to listen to a speaker to listen to music. Uh, basically, by moving data from these devices, um, you generate a cryptocurrency, which is called Nodal Cash, and you get paid. So that's the, the main principles of the network. And uh, I can tell you uh, a bit more as we keep on speaking, yeah. how we got the idea, why we believe in this kind of new decentralized wireless network, why it is so important also uh, and um, but just to come back to the what it is and the vision is really about connecting the next three and things we believe by uh, uh, basically participating in a network at some point and if you use your smartphone for that uh, we will be able to pay almost to um, the level of the cost of your data, mobile data plan that's part of our mission we want to arrive to the point where Actually, for participating, you get paid and you will be able to pay for your mobile data with what you receive in compensation. Um, and, uh, and it's pretty exciting projects. We are more than 40 people now participating into the project actively. And we are spread out around the globe. Uh, with main, uh, have main center, I would say, in San Francisco, another one in New York, another one in Europe with uh, France and, uh, and other countries. People, but we have people working from Asia, Hong Kong, India. So yeah, it's pretty exciting um, project with a with a team of fantastic people. Like, yeah, really passionate about what they do. Yeah, and just to even even lay the foundation a little more. You mentioned that the noodle cash is what people get paid. Uh, what what is the? Can you explain more about the incentive structure? So we have these you know millions trillions of devices that are connected. What is the idea behind paying people to use them? Or how does the sort of ecosystem structurally work? So we we are building what we call, the, you could simplify it and say it's like kind of a multi-sided marketplace. On one side, you have people who provide access to the network, to the internet, who we call, we call them contributors. And like I mentioned before, the best way to contribute today is to download the Nodal Cash app on your phone and start participating. When you come across um, sensors, uh, Bluetooth tags, IoT devices, then your smartphones can connect to these devices and move data from these devices to the internet. So um, when you this process happens, uh, you get compensated by uh, the cryptocurrency, which is called Nodal Cash. And so the more data you move, the more you get compensated and the more value there is in the data you move. For example, if a, um, a logistic company is paying uh, us to locate uh, shipping pallets, which is a good example. And if these shipping pallets are equipped with very small Bluetooth tags, then when you come across these uh, items, then uh, your reward is going to be slightly higher uh, than if it is, for example, just uh, uh, an information coming from a uh, uh, a weather base station in the city uh, where basically we don't have an agreement yet with the manufacturer and you are still collecting some information like the, the local temperature, for example. So that's the principle. That's one side of the marketplace. You can participate also if you are an app developer. You can 
put whole networking library into your app. And that gives you another way to monetize instead of advertising. And by participating with your own network of users, with say your apps, basically you start generating also another cash and you get compensated in another cash. On the other side of the marketplace, we have the businesses enterprise who can use the services that are built on the network. And in the middle, you have app developers uh, that are building application on this network. And uh, uh, because we are really at the beginning, even if we have been at that project for four years, um, the first application we have built them ourselves. So the first application that we have is, a, is what we call an API for collecting data from sensors and locating things. Uh, and uh, we have businesses, which can be, for example, rapid couriers, logistic companies uh, that want to uh, actually locate items using this network. So the same principle mm -hmm. than what, uh, for example, Apple is doing with their Apple AirTag but for uh, at a larger scale with more uh, more industrial uh, and uh, for basically not only tags, but also appliances, devices that want to get access to, to the network. Mm. And in the case of Apple, so say take by analogy, Apple's example, they have the Apple tag. You use the tag to find things. You know, I, I stick the tag on things, then I hit the button, then I know where it is. Uh, in your case, it's different because obviously you're issuing cryptocurrency for people who have or specifically devices that are on the network what does a device have to do to earn nodal cash is it is it is it the is it based on the amount of data that it's issuing so the the data is itself a form of currency in the network um one piece i i i want to make sure i i and the listeners are clear on is the, in so the incentives you, so, of it so so the um... The other formula, today it's pretty basic. It's basically just based, like as you mentioned, on the amount of data that you move. And uh, and some of the data can be noise because we want people to be engaged. Mm -hmm. So maybe it is just noise from some devices which uh, are not directly customers of the network, but uh, that data can also have some value as well because it's public information. So for example, it can be uh, information about temperature, if it's a thermometer, uh, it could be, uh, a ride-sharing uh, car that's using a Bluetooth devices that's and broadcasting uh, an identity and uh, basically the name of the ride-sharing company, uh, and and all these kind of informations can also be marketed and have uh, and have value. Uh, and um, and so today, to come back to your question, yeah, it's just based on the amount of data that you are moving, uh, and uh, as it, the network becomes more dense, that we as we start to have more customers. Then, uh, if like someone is paying for connecting to their, I would give you a simple example. We 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 noticed that there was a lot of manufacturer. One manufacturer in particular of making um, espresso machines using Bluetooth as an interface. So let's say now that manufacturer wants to collect statistics about these machines or know when it has to basically contact the customer. Um, and it decides to use the network to do that, then each time someone comes in proximity on one of these devices, it will recognize it, connect to it, retrieve the information, send it back to the manufacturer. Uh, and that, because we the network gets paid and the system ecosystem gets paid, then obviously you get compensated if you are the one nearby the machine more than if it was just a random packet mm. of information. So, um, so that's, and that's going to evolve, uh, it takes time. Uh, and uh, but the goal is really to arrive to a fully decentralized network, completely autonomous, um, and um, yeah, I think we we have a good shot at it. Uh, we are super excited, like I mentioned yeah. before, fantastic team, it, it, and uh, and there also something we really have at core as we build this because we noticed all the flaws in security and privacy. So we really are building this with uh, security and privacy at the core, and we believe we can bring to the market a simple solution that can enable not connecting billions of things like uh, often you see a big consultancy firm saying, oh, yeah, there are 15 billion IoT devices or 30 billion IoT devices. We truly believe that we are entering in a world which is going from connected world to a hyper-connected world where it's not going to be tens of billions of things. It's going to be hundreds of billions to a trillion things. Mm. And there are many reasons why. First, we need it. We, I think that if we want to do a better job at uh, improving efficiencies, at uh, managing supply, resources, and having less waste, we need more information, and we need that information to flow better. And for that, we need that information to come from almost anything. 
And uh, with the cost of Bluetooth wireless specifically going down, uh, and you, you, you're going to be able to have almost like stickers, small stickers or tags that you can put on anything that will have sensors. And these will be able to actually uh, collect and move information. So we're entering in a world where everything is going to be connected, whether they are always all the time connected to the internet or just from time to time. Mm. Uh, and uh, we, we call that uh, the world where it, it's going to be a notion of awareness. And like if you are interested in the topic and if there are people interested in this, there's a really, really good book, book called uh, Trillions that I recommend that really describe wh what is the world that basically we are going to be living in. Interesting. It, let me take the example of the, the espresso machine because I can wrap my mind around that. Uh, so the espresso machine, would, would that machine need the internal capability to uh, display and connect via Bluetooth? Or is this a sticker or something external that's, that's connected to the machine? So in, in that particular use case, the machine has a Bluetooth wireless interface. Um, and uh, what is fantastic with this protocol, which is Bluetooth, I mean, at the beginning it was, if you remember Bluetooth 10, 15 years ago, was hardly working, always problems of pairing with yeah. devices. Now Bluetooth Low Energy works pretty well. They've done an amazing job. And more than that, what they have done, uh, they have also um, created a language, which is called GAT, which is a, a very well codified and you can have two bluetooth device communicate with one another using that language so if you come into proximity with uh, this nespresso machine and now you've got just maybe the identity or you can recognize it's a it's a, not an espresso espresso machine and um, you you can start to send queries where you can to retrieve information so what's the status of the machine uh, what's uh, get mm. information from different sensors that are in the machine. We can really query the machine to retrieve that information. And then you will be able to send it back to the owner actually of the, or the manufacturer of the machine. And so the, the, the pieces that are aligning here are the devices themselves are becoming more sophisticated with the Bluetooth technology intertwined in the, in the manufacturing. So more manufacturers now are creating devices that have Bluetooth in them. The Bluetooth technology itself has become more reliable and less faulty. And then there's also the incentives, which makes sense, but the incentives for the device manufacturers to receive the data back is the, is the, is the incentive for the device manufacturers to receive that data for uh, product improvement, uh, customer service. Are they, are they basically saying, Hey, we want to receive that data from the devices, from the consumers for quality improvement, or are there other uh, use cases for the benefit of that data? Well, so that specific um, uh, use case that I was mentioning with the espresso machine, we realized they were actually industrial espresso machine for bars. So they can know where the machine end up. Uh, they can uh, get the status of these machines if there's something uh, that's not working, basically. Uh, so it's um, for, for, for that purpose. Mm. Um, but any manufacturer could using Bluetooth and depending on the sensor they have on any kind of appliance, decide what kind of information they want to uh, make accessible and what they want to, and, and, and they may want to have different uh, reasons why. It could be just also a, a firmware update. So what we have on our um, SDK now, I mean, our networking library that is in smartphones, it's kind of a virtual machine. So you could have a manufacturer push their own app at the edge of the network on people's smartphone. And when they need that appliance, um, they can check the version of the firmware. And if they need the firmware update, then it can be processed automatically, for example. Mm. And so in the case of uh, people getting paid to, to, let's see, let me phrase this correctly. So when the uh, nodal cash is issued to the uh, wallet holder of the Bluetooth device mm -hmm. that's producing the data, the value of that data is in the ability of the manufacturer to service the, the products, to communicate the product, to locate the products, you know, provide, provide all that extra value that they wouldn't have had by not having connectivity and access to uh, that device in the first place. So the, the uh, presumably the nodal cache value is originating from if you go upstream, if this makes sense, it's originating from like how this, I, I'm, what I'm um, in a long winded way, I'm trying to pinpoint how this makes life better for people. So I think 
it, in the way of, again, the coffee machine, the espresso machine, it allows the owner of the espresso machine to receive better service, a, a higher quality machine that's automatically getting updated. Uh, you know, that, that, is so that I, where it's realized? I, yeah, I see where you want to go. Yes, you, and you make a very good point. I, I think uh, in, the, the, in this specific example, for the user, it would mean that maybe the uh, so let's say in this, it was, we are talking about industrial uh, espresso machine. The bar, uh, the owner of the machine would receive a call saying uh, from the manufacturer, "Oh, we noticed that you may have um, basically some issues with some parts in your machine. Uh, we're going to send someone. Uh, when is a good time to come and basically fix it?" So that that's this kind of things, right? And that obviously will make your life better. Uh, in that case, it's more like a commercial industrial case use case but you can do that for consumers so for example we speak with a rapid rapid uh, courier companies i'm not going to mention any names here uh, and uh, it is it's funny because i was actually on the phone with uh, the ceo of that very large company i was waiting for an electric bike and for 72 hours uh, i live in san francisco i Impossible to get to know where my bike was from the manufacturer of the bike. He was telling me, no, you have to contact basically your rapid courier uh, to get the information. And uh, when I go to the website of the rapid courier or to go to the store, nobody knew where my bike was. And uh, for 72 hours, I could absolutely not locate it. And I wanted my bike and I would have paid. I would have been maybe ready to pay tens of dollars to have that information. Um, so what we can do with a network like ours for these people is uh, first we can, because the cost of uh, and the min miniaturization of these Bluetooth uh, tags is, are going to become so small, so cheap, uh, that basically we'll be able to, to, to use them almost like RFID. RFID, to give you an idea, which is more for industrial application, it's 20 billion units a year. Mm. So now if you can have a tag where the cost is basically sub-dollar, uh, and that provides a, a, a way for people to know when they uh, send even a letter, let's say you turn it into a smart stamp or a label, now you can have a very granular um, uh, visibility and a very precise idea of where this item is. So you can, if, if that bike and the package had that kind of technology and it was using a network like, oh, well, ours, I would have known where it is. Uh, I wouldn't have spent hours with, uh, on the phone with the vendor, with the rapid courier. I mean, I would have saved time. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and for them, it would have been just an extra, not even buck, uh, basically expense. And, uh, and the reality is that I would have been pay, ready to pay almost tens of dollars to have that information and to be able to access it all the time. Mm. So it's, um, and, and that's where the, we, we, you can have actually amazing volumes because when you look at how many mails and packages are sent every day, I mean, just in the US, it's in, uh, it's in millions, uh, and it doesn't mean that everything needs to be located that precisely, but maybe a fraction, five, ten percent of these items could actually uh, use this kind of technology and this kind of network. Uh, and another thing is uh, if you go now outside of the U.S. and you go in countries like South America, Brazil, uh, where a lot of these things get stolen or disappear. So imagine the impact you can have actually on society, just making things better, function better. Uh, and avoid theft. So it's a, uh, it actually can have a lot of impact. Mm. I, and and uh, I want to make sure I understand the technology and where it's going. So these Bluetooth tags, they are, are they similar to say a RFID tag where they're not active, but they're passive. So they require some sort of uh, scanning device to interact and identify that, uh, that Bluetooth tag, or are they I imagine this may vary, but are they, they're not emitting a signal. So they're not collectively uh, participating or creating a network. They are more or less uh, passive emitters of information. Is that right? Is that correct? So they, they in, in, in the case of Bluetooth, uh, I mean, you, you could imagine both scenarios, but uh, for, for this kind of very low cost um, attacks that we're going to see on the market pretty soon, uh, no, they are actually active. It's just that the, maybe the frequency at which that they start to basically push information in the air is uh, can be uh, changed and, and lower. But the, the impact is actually on, on battery is pretty low. Uh, it is true that you, what you can do also, you can have these devices 
even charge and retrieve energy from uh, 4G or 5G cell phones around and use the energy from the radio waves to actually uh, be able to get powered and then send back a signal in return. So we're going to we're going to see that. Wow. And this is also coming up. That's crazy. Uh, and uh, that's that that's pretty cool. But the great thing is you can even add sensors to that. You can have a humidity sensor, you can have a temperature sensor, you can have um, pressure. Uh, so now if you put that on items, you can also store within the sensors, I mean, the, and, and the radio, history of what, of what happened, history of temperature, history of humidity. So very good for um, the food chain uh, or for um, actually in, 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 this, in the industry of uh, pharmaceuticals. So, I mean, yeah, I think these, these things are going to improve efficiencies, make life better for everyone, uh, and um, remove part of the waste, improve uh, things for recycling better more often. Yeah. So, because, because at some point you can print them. So, you could even have that on cardboard. Right, right. Whether it's a bottle, a glass, or a... Or just a box. So it's almost like you could have on every bottle, on every garbage bin, you could track the entire life cycle of products. So you could, in theory, you could go to a, a site and say, you know, I have a yerba mate tea, right? And I'm deciding as a consumer, how well does yerba mate, uh, as, as a company or the product, how well do they recycle their products? And so we could look at, you know, last year there was a billion bottles printed and this is how many went to recycling this is how many went into there's just more of an understanding of the life cycle of products so that would be huge i mean when you move the cost of producing one of these bluetooth tags to, to near zero it it does create a quite a different world uh, <laughs> as you describe it more so you get it you you, you get it uh, and um and that's w where it comes to i mean i think one of the reasons we build also this network, and I, I like to say the why, is b because we believe that building this giant network, we're actually creating, um, and it's very much in the, in, I would say in the trend of Web3, it's in the trend, I, I realize that also even Singularity University is now teaching classes on it. It's about abundance. Mm. And we can enter into a society where if you lay down this new infrastructure, you can have a multitude of applications being built on top that are going to generate new revenues, improve efficiencies, uh, and you can uh, really um, try to push uh, towards uh, more abundance. Uh, because if you have this uh, data liquidity, this ocean of awareness, and you can use all that information to create services that are going to generate additional revenues, it, it, it's it's almost infinite. Mm. Yeah, are there are there other try to show on this on the on the on this logo. Yeah, yeah, we were, <laughs> we were talking about that pre-show. Your your logo for uh, Nodal is, is is similar. Reminds me to almost like a wave, but it also looks like an infinity sign of the constant looping back, which refers to the, the connectivity of the network. Are there other examples that you can throw out while there, while we're on the topic of how this impacts people on a day to day? We we talked about the life cycle of products. We talked about the connectivity to uh, like in the case of an espresso machine so they can push updates to it and service it better. We talked about uh, products like your bike where you can track where it's located in the mail. Is there anything else you think that you've talked about that's, uh, you know, people, when they hear it, they think, oh, wow, that's, that's going to make my life better. This is going to be a big deal. There, there are a few examples. Um, and, and one that we really have at heart is a, uh, so first, in one of our mission, we want to arrive to um, for, for our users who use the app and generate the cryptocurrency. We would like this to be able to pay for your mobile data plan. Mm. And we think because of the value you can actually uh, move and eventually actions you can take for the network that uh, there's a way that we can arrive to the point where we pay for your mobile data plan monthly. Uh, and uh, if we push that a bit further, we are a network which is 100% software. So our networking stack can go on smartphones, can go on cars, uh, it can go on base station. And uh, we we really believe that at some point, and we have a, a prototype running, my co-founder Garrett and I, where uh, we actually call each other on uh, on 4G, so using a cellular network with open spectrum. So it's unlicensed spectrum. Uh, and uh, and uh, our app can run on that box and generate cryptocurrency. So ultimately, we believe that people in our network uh, potentially could be the one uh, subsidizing uh, and, and purchasing, I mean, investing in the infrastructure 
of 4G, potentially even 5G, and then that way be paid by the, the coins they generate uh, and provide free access uh, to the nodal users, free wow. 4G and 5G access. Wow. And I think it's very important. Uh, I think the world needs a decentralized, very powerful decentralized wireless network because it's a way to guarantee uh, basically um, information free flow. Uh, I mean, how would we, would we be living tomorrow if we didn't have access to the internet? Yeah. And kind of hard to conceive a life where you don't have access to the internet nowadays. Yeah. But that being said, I mean, look at all the threat in the world that could really threaten our daily access to the internet. I mean, we are still living on a planet where you have big powers, big countries. You don't know who wants to go at war with who. Uh, or where it may, when it may happen, you don't know the impact this may have on actually people's daily life. If there was a third world war, for example, what would be the impact on people's daily life? What would be the impact on people's internet? Uh, so I think to lay down the foundations and the ecosystem to enable people to build uh, and to have a fully decentralized infrastructure that can sustain anything, uh, because it's powered by people, and when it's decentralized, it's more resilient. Mm. Uh, there are less dependencies on central systems. Then uh, I think it's a very important thing. It, it, uh, and, uh, and this this would be effectively when you say decentralized Wi-Fi, global Wi-Fi system. What you're describing or imagining is that individuals, maybe I, my neighbors, people all around me, we all have Wi-Fi emitters. So we're participating in the network, we're creating the network, and then we're because we're decentralized we are sustaining it. So now, by contrast, we have uh, telecom companies like Verizon and AT&T, and they have large towers. They emit a uh, signal out that we connect to in our phones. That and So you're basically saying that, that those carriers, those companies aren't going to be, that's the centralized status quo, and, and the decentralized is we don't need those towers or the centralized um, broadband companies, centralized telco companies. Is that is, is that generally the, do you agree with what I'm saying? Does what I'm saying make sense? So I, I, I think we still need the telcos because it's going to be very hard to replace um, centralized, very efficient actually in cellular infrastructure. But that being said, um, we can build uh, better connectivity in places where the telcos wouldn't invest because mm. the way a telco functions is uh, they look at their return on investment. So if you live in a very small town with very few inhabitants uh, and uh, it costs them a lot of money to deploy uh, cell towers or their infrastructure to provide you with the latest high-speed uh, mobile internet with 5G, for example, they're not going to do it. Mm. They won't take the investment. But if you do it because you live in that city and your neighbors and basically the community there wants to have a 5G high-speed access, why not? I mean, they... they there's no reason why they shouldn't, then they will be able to actually invest in their own infrastructure. And because now you have more and more uh, open spectrum, so uh, there is a, um, a spectrum called CBRS, which is free, where you can run 4G and 5G on it. So people will be able to deploy their own infrastructure. And basically, you will be able to connect using 4G or 5G to this infrastructure. Yeah. And uh, it's going to be the case in businesses. It's going to be the case in small communities that basically are where telcos don't want to make any investment. Has long has obviously you have a backhaul, but the backhaul can be fiber, the backhaul can be cable, the backhaul can be satellite today. So it could be a, a Starlink, Starlink uh, yeah. going to a small community uh, and people are building around uh, basically their own cellular infrastructure to be and and providing access. Yeah. So the ecosystem we created is built to enable all this thing and to make sure that people, if they make the investment, actually can get a return quickly uh, on their investment. And that, that would happen the same way they do today with our app on a smartphone. They would have an app for their base station and the app would be generating uh, our cryptocurrency, which is Nodal Cash. Interesting, okay. So, but this piece of it in particular, the Wi-Fi piece is in the roadmap or that is that's not available today, is it? So we are testing it on 5G and 4G with my co-founder mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we play with it. Uh, we believe there's already a huge work and a lot of things and development yeah. and growth 
that's going on now uh, just by laying down a, a, a Bluetooth decentralized infrastructure. Um, and uh, because like I mentioned before, and we were exchanging about it, I mean, Bluetooth is really a disruptive wireless technology yeah. uh, and we've enabled to connect almost anything. Uh, and uh, the big bet we took is when we talk about Bluetooth, people say, oh, but there's uh, not much long range. How are you going to reach to these devices? Um, but it doesn't matter because uh, you have 6 billion smartphones today on the planet. And these 6 billion smartphones who are owned by people, they go everywhere. Mm. And it's enough to create a resilient infrastructure and be able to connect things that were never connected before. Mm. And we're just leveraging what we call the smartphone infrastructure with this ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, because every smartphone is a Wi-Fi. Uh, you know, it's all connected to the network. So it it acts as a range extender, so to speak. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, you described a few different things. When you built this technology in the beginning, You, uh, how did you think about laying the technical infrastructure? W w were there some key decisions? I know that you, I, I believe that you built it on Polkadot. Um, walk me through a, a little bit about how this, how, how, how it integrates or how it's built on Polkadot um, and what, what that decision and implications were. Where are we in terms of uh, status so of it's, um, blockchain? It, it, it's, it has been an iterative process. And uh, when you innovate and you, you are kind of at the edge of what can be done with these technologies of blockchain and wireless, uh, you have to be ready to actually rewrite uh, often uh, to improve the overall ecosystem. So when we started we, um, and created the token, we, we actually used the Stellar network. Mm. And uh, last year in May, a bit before, actually in the first quarter, we were reaching a number of transactions that was completely gigantic. We were doing 1.4 million daily microtransactions, which was representing 40% of the whole Stellar network. And uh, it was not ready. So <laughs> I mean, our nodes were kicked out all the time. We were representing 40% of the whole network. And we quickly had to find a solution. I mean, the people at Stellar Foundation, which were also I mean, great people, I mean, find a solution. We can we we can't keep you on this network. It's not possible. And um, since we knew we wanted to have an ecosystem that can evolve, we knew that we would go towards a, a chain that would be more custom. And we look at two alternatives. There was Polkadot on one side, Cosmos on the other one. And uh, I followed the work, um, I mean, of Gavin uh, Wood uh, at Polkadot. I mean, I met him with Vitalik when they were really just starting to build uh, Ethereum. Mm. Uh, and I've always been, be, always been a, a big um, admirer of, uh, of his work. And, uh, and then we, de we dug in with my uh, chief blockchain officer, uh, Elliot, and uh, we realized that there was much more to do and potentially it would be more flexible. And it was a great thing if we were building on top of Substrate, which is the, the open source below us, basically Polkadot. So that's why we made that choice. We are super happy that we made that choice, even if it's still very experimental because we are dealing with a lot of transactions in the blockchain world with a new blockchain. So you have to be ready. Sometimes it fails. And uh, yeah. uh, and we know that at some point it will be super reliable and we won't have any issues. Um, and um, But yeah, you got to be ready for for rewriting, changing things. and uh, Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's it, it's it, it's new. All these things are new, but they work. They will, now they work at scale. Uh, it's proven for us that it works better than what we had before, uh, and uh, so we are super happy we made that choice. And what I like also is the Polkadot ecosystem, and the notion of the parachains. It's kind of replicating a little bit the idea of the internet at the beginning, where you have all these servers collaborating to build this giant network. But this time you can have all these different blockchain ecosystem collaborating what they call being composable to exchange services in a trustless manner. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's very, very important. And um, it's going to help actually accelerate to build what I call this infrastructure of abundance. Uh, and mm. I think it's on, a, it, it, it's on a good track. Yeah, that's super interesting to hear about your experience with, with Polkadot. Um, one, of the, one of the opinions I put out there in the world a few years ago was, uh, on net neutrality. So in the US, uh, I, I'm sure you're familiar with it. I, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. But I, I thought that the government should not be 
should not have the uh, power to regulate the pricing of uh, of the internet, regulate the utility companies, the telco companies, to force them to build in areas where there's not a lot of people, and then uh, control what kind of control the data flow on that. So saying, you know, telco companies shouldn't have access to certain data. Um, the net neutrality argument was surprising to me because a lot of the people in tech that were very open and free and did not want the government involved on in the internet in the early days were saying we we want net neutrality. If you're if you're a supporter of net neutrality, that is to say you are a supporter of the idea that the government should regulate internet utility companies that are providing access to, to Wi-Fi. And I thought one of the downsides, the unforeseen downsides of this, is that it creates a, a lack of innovation. You know, if you say, for instance, um, you know, uh, a, a Wi-Fi, a, a, a tower that emits Wi-Fi has to have a certain area. It has to, you know, emit to a certain number of people. If, if this is dictated by regulations, then you couldn't have the innovation that we see today, which is a, you know, a, a small Wi-Fi tower is just stuck to the side of a building or this decentralized network or, uh, you know, satellites in the air. And I, I, I don't know. I'm curious where where you initially stood on it, well, or if, you're, a, if your views so have I, changed. Actually, so actually, I I um, I mean, it's a topic I was I had really at heart. Mm. Uh, I remember I think it was in 2012. Uh, in a previous company, I had a network with already a few million people, where we were doing um, mobile bandwidth sharing for free when telcos were charging 50 bucks a month to let you share your bandwidth from your smartphone to have a hotspot. Now it's free almost all the time, but mm. you used to pay $50 to be able to share your mobile data with your laptop or, or uh, uh, and, and tablet, for example. And uh, there was a big debate around net neutrality. And I mean, net neutrality is important because uh, if uh, you don't have net neutrality, uh, it means that tomorrow, uh, I mean, or companies like YouTube, for example, wouldn't be able to exist. And, and one thing that they do provide, which is fantastic, is actually is access to information and uh, to anyone. And it doesn't matter uh, if uh, you pay uh, a cheap uh, internet access or uh, you, you, you can still access YouTube and see all the videos you, you, you basically you want to see. And, and that's what is important about net neutrality is it guarantees this information to flow uh, and it's not throttled by the telco who's providing the link even, link, even if the videos and YouTube basically use much more bandwidth than another service, which is email, for example. Mm. So in that sense, net neutrality do really plays, uh, play a very important role. Uh, and I think uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's how do you want to enable free access and easy access to any kind of information and not actually uh, limit that access to for the greater number of people. So in that sense, yeah, net neutrality is, is very, very important. And I remember uh, in 2012, I think we even notified all the users on the app to call their local senator to actually uh, make sure uh, they would uh, not pass. Uh, I don't remember the name of that law that was actually trying to uh, to limit net neutrality. Yeah. So, but your point is your point is interesting about innovation. Uh, and uh, actually, I'd never look at that angle, but yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, maybe if things were forth, there would be new innovation to actually enable the net neutrality in different ways um, because it's so important. Uh, the issue is in the telco space, and especially in wireless, a lot of this spectrum are basically rented uh, auction to large telco companies. Uh, I think what should happen is actually these, these big assets of spectrum should be completely open. That's where we would see the biggest spark into in innovation, uh, and um, yeah. So I don't know if it's gonna we're gonna see that soon, so, but uh, I think that would bring a lot of innovation. So for sure. when you were running it, I think the uh, I think that the debate or the change uh, in the FCC in the U.S. was around 2017. This is when I, I remember it being a, a topic of discussion. The movement was. Uh, away from net neutrality. So I think the verdict was that um, there's two different titles, like uh, Title One, Title Two, And I believe that the verdict was there, there's not go there wasn't regulation. Um, so net neutrality did not come to be and people were, you know, protesting this, and they were upset about this. And like you said, they called their, their local representatives. But the impact of it doesn't seem 
I, I wonder what is the impact? What was the supposed impact? And then in my view, it didn't seem like we had all that much downside from allowing, uh, you know, free open innovation. Um, well, I, I think what we would need to know and, and, and search is, uh, did actually telco took any real action mm. or did any, anything really changed yeah. uh, following that? Yeah, that's, and my guess is, uh, I don't think much changed. Yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> so, do, do, do you think there's any, by, by parallel, do you see any necessary, uh, regulation or, or do you have a philosophy of regulation for the internet of things? So say, you know, fast forward five years, 10 years, there's a trillion devices. Uh, the, the nodal network is massive. People are getting paid the, the currency, the nodal cash is flowing through the network. Is there a role for centralized government to prevent bad actors or unforeseen negative consequences? Are the things that people should be thinking about from a regulatory position now anticipating it in the future? Well, I, I, so I, I'm, um, always, uh, against actually too much regulation. I think it's kills innovation. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, um, one thing though, that is important, uh, I think it's privacy and making sure that, uh, people's privacy is protected, uh, making sure that IOT devices are secure. So, um, maybe some, I mean, check to, especially on manufacturers to make sure what they build is secure mm. and it's not going to expose people to privacy. I think that's important. Uh, in that sense, yeah, maybe some kind of regulation could play well for, for the consumers, uh, and for everyone's daily life. So I think that's important. That could be a, a way to do it. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. You, you must hear the talk around AI. Uh, Elon Musk is, is pretty famous for saying that we should be thinking about regulations on artificial intelligence, because when it gets to a point, it's going to be, uh, superior intellectually than people are, and there could be negative consequences from that. So now's the time to start thinking about that. And it's a debate because we don't know what the time horizon is to develop that technology. And we don't know the, the actual practical impl implementation of the negative consequences of that. Like what, what does that look like? Well, it's, it, it's a big, it's a big debate. It's really mm. the principle of singularity actually, where, mm. uh, maybe we are creating machines and systems that are going to be smarter than us. Uh, and these systems, because they become smarter, we will even potentially create new systems that will be smarter than they are. Uh, so if you believe in evolution, maybe it's not a bad thing. If you uh, want to preserve a uh, human race, uh, yeah, maybe there needs to be some regulation at some point. Yeah. Or uh, actually uh, some uh, information, education around what does it mean? And the implication when you use artificial intelligence or when you deal with inter inter artificial intelligence. So I think education is going to be the first very, very important thing. Um, now, I would say in the, in the sake of evolution, if you can create a system that's smarter than um, us, and you can have that system be able to actually reflect on itself to create an even smarter new system, I, I I feel that's exciting, uh, but it, it has a lot of implications. It means question about consciousness. What is consciousness? Will this machine this machine have consciousness? Maybe there's a way to to I mean to yeah to have them have some form of consciousness. Yeah. So um, yeah, it opens up a lot of questions, and uh, I think it's, we are still very early. Yeah. Even if when you look at the results of OpenAI, for example, and uh, especially in terms of conversations, what you can do with AI systems today, it's pretty impressive. Uh, so far, I think it has, a, I mean, a, a good influence on the way things are going to be built or conceived. It accelerates cycles also a lot. Mm. Um, uh, and, uh, and actually at some point, it's really going to intersect with uh, blockchain and IoT because you're going to need, since you get smarter systems, you're going to need ways to take decisions. You're going to need trust, I mean, trustless systems. So uh, I think we're going to see the first DAO, so decentralized autonomous uh, basically organization using AI and take a, and have decisions basically uh, taken, recorded on the blockchain, uh, and uh, and and interact and have directly actions on the real world through IoT. Mm. So yes, we, these things are going to happen, but they are 
things that would be great to automate actually i think that would make the world better and holiday life better mm. if they were uh, maybe uh, controlled or uh, uh, yeah, by, by this kind of new system so i think ai combined with blockchain actually and iot that's a very 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 interesting interesting topic and very interesting applications in the future yeah yeah i, I totally agree I, I think that i almost think of it as like my mental model for this is that AI and the Internet of Things and blockchain, these are all they're all engines towards a hyper efficient future. So in, in the, we're, we're marching towards efficiency. Now, the the paramount question is, what are we being efficient at? So we could be efficient at reducing energy production. There's certainly low hanging fruit, but the decisions, the direction that we decide to go. So say we want to remove carbon from the atmosphere like that. That's the that's what we say is the absolute goal. Well, the decisions better be right. You know, I think the consequences for bad decisions are going to be higher and higher as we march further because the power that we're collectively utilizing through AI and blockchain is is so big that if we're if we're wrong in this like we're humans we're we experience a problem we throw out a solution this is for all of human history and then the solution has negative consequences and then we have a new set of problems and then we we solve those and they introduce a new set of problems and it's kind of this falling forward effect and i think the the impact of well go ahead i mean if the system become it's taught to and with AI, you can become self-aware of these things hmm. Then it can also, for example, work or behave in a way to reduce carbon emission, you know, and make sure that basically the energy put uh, at work to realize that uh, this better efficiency in carbon emission basically doesn't cause, uh, doesn't have secondary effect. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, th mm. that's one of the reasons we want, we need more and more, and more powerful computers. Uh, we need more and more ways to consume less energy while computing. Um, and, uh, yeah, so all these things are, are important. Yeah. 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 And then we're marching towards, it's like, well, if you, if, if the, if the end goal, like the utopian goal is a, a world that's sustainable, it's producing enough and it's able to consume enough energy. It's not overproducing energy. So we're not heating up the world. Like things are sustainable. Then it's like, well, where do humans fit in that? And I, I think there's kind of like a interstellar. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Interstellar, but part part of the underlying subtext of the movie is that it's in the evolution of humans to move on to new worlds, to, to build civilizations. So like we can't just stay here forever, mm -hmm. which I agree with. I mean, conceptually, we have the ability to do that. So well, it I, makes sense that we mm -hmm. would do that. I think we have, uh, it, it makes sense. I mean, we, are, we, we like to explore, we like to we are fascinated by the idea of, to, I think, as a civilization to go on to other planets. Yeah. Fascinated by the idea of encountering another civilization, maybe that's already out there. Uh, I think what's important is also to transform society so people's time uh, can be uh, actually geared towards uh, things that can help evolve faster. So I think w when, what I like with the Web3 movement and uh, what we see now with blockchain and this new eco ecosystem being built. And what, it comes back to what I was I was saying before. I think we are shifting this mindset from scarcity, which is the old world where we have to manage resources, mm. where basically there is an accumulation of wealth linked to scarcity of uh, of resources or concentration of these resources, to a world where which is basically abundance. Uh, and if you arrive in a world and you build the infrastructure to enable actually this abundance, uh, then people are going to start to have more time. That's why you start to have debates about. Uh, uh, universal basic income or, uh, or, or, or new ways to generate income passively uh, and uh, and middle cash is part of that and then you can have more time so people can basically start to focus and gear their time towards uh, doing new things being more creative have a better education uh, and all these things are going to help us evolve as a human species mm. uh, to actually maybe create the conditions to be able to go faster to or the planet and, uh, and, and, and then becomes a multi-planet species if uh, basically that's what we are meant to be. Yeah. So, um, but I think the abundance and laying down the infrastructure for abundance is really key in that. Yeah. And we have to shift this mindset yeah. uh, from the old industrial capitalism world, which has worked very well up until now, 
to this new mindset of abundance. Yeah, totally agree. And when people move away from this mindset of scarcity towards abundance, and they have you know, on the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you have food, you have shelter. You, you, when you have those safety, uh, what would you call those? Those attributes of life. You know, you have food, you have shelter. Then you start to think this is this is actually scientifically recognized. There's been research on this as socioeconomic. Uh, groups of people rise in socioeconomics, they care more about their environment. It's like your your concentric circle of what you care about grows as you feel safe. So as you experience more abundance in your life, you want other people around you, your family, your community. And then at the top is, I care about the whole world. So I want to help the entire world you know, survive. And it's, it's like, it's kind of beautiful in a way where the way that society is sort of naturally structured is that we have to help everybody in society in order for those people to care about all of the society, all of the world. So I, you know, I look at what you guys are doing as like a, as like a, a key part in the infrastructure to allow people to, to care more. Um, so yeah, it's awesome. I, I really commend you guys on your progress. In terms of the actual uh, state of the business now, you mentioned you have over 40 employees. You guys have raised money uh, through, remind me, has it been through traditional means? Yeah, or? I mean, we, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are, I mean, we're well funded now. Mm. Uh, and uh, we can't wait to have actually um, a token at some point uh, being exchanged and people buying services. Uh, and like uh, even large enterprise, it's going to take a bit of time, but uh, I, I think uh, we are entering this world of uh, crypto. Uh, and uh, what I find fascinating is uh, you probably have 70 to 80 million crypto users worldwide and people who have a wallet and use crypto uh, and you have 6 billion smartphones. And so when you look at the room and for improvement is actually huge. We are yeah. just at the beginning. Yeah. We are really just at the beginning, yeah. and uh, so that that is super exciting. I think it's a uh, and um, what we're going to see in the coming years, I think, is uh, going to be unbelievable. Yeah, I think we can really shift the way uh, economies and system are going to interact. I think it's going to do so much good mm. uh, and improve efficiencies at all levels at some point. Mm. And uh, what appears today to be for some people a bit a chaotic industry, I, I think is going to redefine. Really actually the way we interact with each other and the way economies uh, function. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look look what you can do uh, with uh, incentivization mechanism on blockchain, with mining, if you take Bitcoin or with our system. I mean, that wouldn't have been possible before. Yeah. And it's all because of cryptography uh, and, and, and new systems, uh, new ecosystem that you can build on blockchain. So I think, yeah, we're just at the beginning. Yeah. And it's really, it's really, I view it as more a process of discovery of the capability of the, of the physical universe, as opposed to us inventing it, you know, as, as, as a species of humans, it's like, it just, it, it feels very much like the natural evolution of the way that we connect to each other and that the way we build society. So it's, um, yeah, I, I, that's the kind of energy I think that fuels people to work super hard and, you know, attract them into the space. So, um, yeah, people wanted to contribute more or get more involved. Obviously there's the app downloading the app, getting that set up. Um, are there other ways? Are you guys hiring people or, um, looking for anything else? We are hiring, uh, and people who are interested to join the, the team, uh, should contact us, hmm. uh, and, uh, and organizations, businesses who want to benefit from the network also should contact us. Um, and uh, yeah, so that, I will recommend people download the app. It's the best way to learn about yeah. it uh, and, and learn about the ecosystem. It's called Nodal Cash. Uh, and uh, we have a pretty active community also uh, on Telegram. It's um, t.me slash Nodal Community. Nice, Telegram, yeah. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah. And we're also having more and more ambassadors worldwide. Uh, so if you are interested, that there are always positions and uh, roles to play in, in to, for helping us growing this ecosystem. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, and thank, thank you, thank you, Mike, for for your time uh, today. Uh, I think we can go, we could go on for another hour talking about these things. It's really fascinating. Totally. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for jumping on. I really appreciate learning more about what you're building and and talking you know, broadly about the direction that humanity is going. So yeah, this is a blast and. Um, Hope to have you back on someday. Excellent. All right. Looking forward to it. Take care, man.